Hello, everybody can hear me okay? I want to let you know that I brought a free copy of this documentary. Um, it's on the end of the table in the postcard. You're welcome to take one. There's a little sign that says free DVDs. Um, this is really exciting for me because I'm the first person to ever stand on a stage like this and talk about this subject matter at such length. And I'm also the first person to have ever done a documentary, no less devoted, like a series of documentaries about this subject matter. So what you're seeing today is somewhat an exclusive first time ever. Um, the reason being is because this is fetal stem cell therapy. It is probably the most misunderstood, controversial, and contested therapy out there in regards to the world of stem cells. You can try to Google search it. You can watch, you can read all the books you want about stem cells. You can watch all the documentaries you want about stem cells. You will notice they will conveniently skip over the subject of fetal stem cell therapy. And even researchers in the United States that are researching it, there's, it's not being done on humans except for the handful of clinical trials in the US. Even those guys are afraid to talk about this publicly. So as you can imagine, as you heard Stephen say, I spent the last decade of my life covering different disruptive, exciting medical technologies. This is sort of the holy grail of them all. You have something that competes with very fierce market forces and of course, you add to it the very divisive and polarizing fact that these things come from, yes, they come from abortions. There's 50 million abortions every year worldwide. As I stand here today for the next 90 minutes, there'll be about close to 9,000 fetuses aborted around the world as I stand here and talk to you. Fetuses are in overwhelming abundance. I often get, people are killing babies on purpose. People are getting pregnant on purpose to contribute fetal tissue. No, they're not. If, even if we harnessed all of the human's resources to try to harvest every fetus available, we couldn't do it. It's just, it's just an overabundance of them. And I'll get into more of that later. But what's interesting about this, I'll say one more thing about how controversial it is, like, and how frustrating it is as a journalist. You know, if you watched a documentary on, say, transportation or read a book on the history of transportation, imagine them leaving out the automobile or the airplane. And it's kind of similar. And, if you, hopefully, at the end of this talk, you'll come to the conclusion like I have that fetal stem cell therapy in regards to stem cells is sort of like the Rolls Royce in the parking lot surrounded by horse and buggies that no one can see. <laughs> it's fascinating. So basically, let's go to the next one here. This is me. Stephen did a great introduction. Um, you're welcome to, I'll, I'll be around later to you know, talk to you, but I want to kind of tell you how I got here. Stephen actually did a great job, so you kind of already heard it, but basically, when I released my first movie, Brzezinski is Cancer is Serious Business, I was very young and naive in the sense of in this space. It was in 2009, Brzezinski's head of finance who was in charge of raising money for his final phase of FDA testing happened to be college buddies with David Axelrod, the newly elected President Obama, and he was his chief of, sorry, college buddies of David Axelrod who was his chief of staff and chief architect. I was, he said, I'm going to meet Axelrod next week. Give me your movie, whatever form it's in. Great, I did. And this is what Axelrod said. This is very important, but it's just too big. Maybe in 10 years we can face this issue. Not now. Too big. And he even alluded, again, this is off the record, candid, college buddy to college buddy, that all the banks just failed last year. Can you imagine what this would do to the market if we released this therapy to the market? So that is just cancer. What I'm going to talk to you about today is bigger than that. Cancer, I did the math, and we all have someone in this, uh, in this room who either has dealt with it or knows someone that has. There's 15 million Americans living with cancer right now. On average, low ball, quarter of a million dollars per cancer patient. Medicare, Medicaid, insurance covers it generally. The low ball, the average, that is close to $4 trillion of revenue. That is bigger than the GDP of many countries, small countries. So, as you can imagine, this is kind of why I'm so excited about this. All right, so moving quite along. I um, did a sequel to Brzezinski because I was in a great position. Cancer patients were emailing me. I said, look, I'm not a doctor, but if you want to go to see this doctor and, and be treated, I followed patients. Everybody I followed were terminal brain cancer patients. They were all supposed to die, told to get their things in order. Half of them lived, half of them died. That was my second movie. Third movie was the whistleblower story about how one of the public relations guys at Sloan Kettering um, did not allow the uh, total cover-up of their laetral studies for five years. Um, by the way, I'm sure many of you have heard of it. 
Eating apricot pits is not the same as the injectable form that they were using on mice, double-blind mouse studies. 80% of the cancer was uh, kept from spreading. Which led me into, finally, in 2014, I started this project. Like many documentary filmmakers, you get emails all the time, oh, you should do a documentary about this, you should do a documentary about that. I get it all the time. And I kept getting kind of badgered about this subject, and I didn't really know a lot about it. I spent a good year just researching it before I really went full force into it and what I'm about to go full force into you, with you today. So going back to how confusing the subject is of fetal stem cells, how most people decide to usually choose that they almost don't exist, you look at cover of Time magazine, August 2001, Dr. James Thompson, the man who brought you stem cells. Well, going back to what I was saying, what this should say is the man that brought you embryonic stem cells. We've been using stem cells since the 1970s, with a bone marrow transplant. This man discovered the first embryonic stem cell. This is a five-day-old blastocyst grown in a lab, putting sperm and an egg together, five days old, petri dish laboratory. What I'm talking to you about today is a fetal stem cell harvested at the end of the first trimester from a voluntary abortion. Embryonic and fetal are constantly confused. You'll read some article about somebody getting a brain tumor from fetal, it wasn't fetal, it was embryonic. Because one of the defining traits Oh, by the way, I contacted this guy because I couldn't find any fetal stem cell experts in the United States that had done it with people. And I'll get into that more later. And at least he was honest. I asked him, will you be in my movie about fetal stem cells? After all, you're the man that brought us stem cells. I wasn't quite that obnoxious, of course. And he said, there's his email, sorry, but this is outside of my area of expertise. I really have to give him respect for being honest about not understanding fetal stem cells being the man that brought you stem cells. So let me just give you a quick stem cell lesson. You know, basically, they are rejuvenating cells. You cut your hand, the stem cells come out of dormancy, they repair your hand. Some people say you wouldn't live an hour without your own stem cells coming out of dormancy and helping you. So as you can imagine, harnessing this idea for a therapy, as we all know about today, is not a bad idea. It's a great idea. The most popular is adult stem cells, the, uh, toggle, toggle, uh, um, the adult stem cells where they take it from your fat or your bone marrow, they wake, them, they wake them up, they give them back to you. Many sports athletes get them. Many of you in this room might know someone that has had adult stem cell therapy. There are hundreds of clinics around the United States doing this. But there are big limitations with this. And one of the big limitations is they're very, very difficult to isolate. There's very small quantities of them. And you're as old as, they're as old as you are. I'm 46 years old. If I got adult stem cell therapy, they're gonna be taking out 46-year-old stem cells from me with all the DNA damage from sunlight flying on airplanes and all the radiation damage, et cetera, waking them up and giving them back to me. But more importantly than all of that, there's no scientific evidence that an adult stem cell taken from your blood or your bone marrow will transform into, say, a neuronal cell, a brain cell, or always definitely transform into a heart cell. When you get stem cell therapy, with the, occasion, with the exception of, say, sports injuries, if you have a heart condition and you undergo adult stem cells, you're hoping that they will help your heart. They have to become heart tissue. It's a very difficult task. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with this therapy, but the limitations are very limited. Its ability is very limited. We've all heard of umbilical cord stem cells. Can somebody bring me a glass of water? <laughs> uh, we've all heard of umbilical cord stem cells. Many people that have children will bank them now. I'm sure you've probably heard of this where in case later in life, um, if there's the kid ends up with a disease or whatever, they can harness the original umbilical cord cells. By the way, if you have done this, they don't, you don't own these cells. The FDA considers them a drug, and the technology is not caught up to where you can have access to them. In my documentary, I have a woman who was very frustrated because she found out that only three people in the country have had access to their own child's umbilical cord cells. But umbilical cord cells are really not much different than adult cells, except they're nine months old, and they're still from blood, just like your cells if you participated in adult stem cells. So the task is just the same. How hard is it for them to become a heart cell, or a neuronal cell, or any kind of cell? There are more clinical trials being done in the US, and there's some like a clinic in Panama that's doing, that's got good results. I'm not saying it's a bad option. I'm just explaining to you the limitations that they have. So what was interesting, this was just a month ago. Boom. Cover of the New York Times, well, in the New York Times, 12 people hospitalized from using umbilical cord cells. 
And it's honestly, it was laziness probably on the part of the scientists not correctly um, you know, testing the cells for any sort of uh, diseases or bacteria. But the thing about umbilical is also that part of the body and the process, that's where the digested food comes through. That's where the feces, feces goes out of. A lot of the toxins concentrate in that area. And these people got sick because of fecal matter and E. coli in the cells. I'm not trying to scare any of you about umbilical. It's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just saying that this kind of thing happens a lot um, in a kind of the wild west of stem cells that's going on right now, especially in the US. Amniotic, not stem cells at all. There's plenty of clinics that offer them. It should be called amniotic product. They're freeze-dried, dead cells, not live. I'm just trying to give you an overview of the space that we're in. Now, embryonic again. I just want to say again, this is a five-day-old blastocyst. It's not what I'm talking about today. Um, I just wanted to bring that up again. But oh yeah, the most important thing about embryonic is, going back to what I said earlier, they do cause tumors, unfortunately, because it's a five-day-old blastocyst. No, no organs have been formed. This thing is a Wild West cell that could do just about anything. So the, one of its defining traits, this is in PubMed, you can find it everywhere, is they create non-cancerous tumors called teratomas. Very awful things can grow inside of you from this, and it's clearly a frightening one for anyone that hopes to have therapy from these cells. There are places in the world you can get it. Some people have had good results. Not saying everyone is going to get it, but it's not the most ideal. Now, all that being said, the only people on Earth that have mastered fetal stem cells are in Ukraine. And I'm going to explain how it came to be. Their clinic is called M-cell, embryonic cell, just to add to the confusion. And the reason for that is, in many cultures, there simply is no vocabulary word for fetal. You can go to Google Translate and try to do it. Ukraine to American, fetal, embryonic, embryonic, fetal, many cultures. So you look at their certificates, it says embryonic cell, embryonic cell, all the regulatory certificates they received, and people go, oh my god, I thought those caused cancer. No, they're using fetal, but different culture. I know it's confusing. I promise I'll get in a more linear fashion, but I just want to try to give you an overview of how convoluted the space is before I focus on fetal. One more time. Not embryonic I'm talking about. I'm talking about fetal. <laughs> Seven to 12 weeks, not five days. All right, here we go. Now, what happens is, basically, at the end of the first trimester, I'm actually going to get into this more in a minute, but I'm going to talk about how this came to be. You're like, OK, well, who would have thought of doing such a thing? The reason that fetal was even thought about as a therapy, other than the fact that stem cells in general, harnessing them is a great idea for regenerative medicine and to help you know, rebuild your body and do preventative medicine, et cetera, Long before M-cell, long before even the bone marrow transplant, scientists have always known that women pregnant, during pregnancy, those cells will leave the womb, particularly at the end of the first trimester, travel around the mother. Women with congenital heart defects have been fixed during pregnancy. They, will, they have been found in the hearts and the brains. And these are recent headlines, by the way, in the last couple of years. But they've known about this for a long time. So, and I'll get to in a minute, the scientists in Ukraine knew this and they decided to harness this. Here's even USA Today. Um, Gordy Howe ended up getting fetal stem cells from a clinic uh, down in Tijuana, but it's a whole other story. And it wasn't quite the same of what I'm talking about today, but so it, the news was buzzing about it for a short period of time. I mean, they, even they reported on it, you know, okay, liver cells from the fetus will go into the mother and repair her damaged liver. This has been known for a while, so as you can imagine, it was a big light bulb moment came off for these scientists. How do we harness this? This is uh, right out of PubMed. Fetal cells migrate to the mother during pregnancy. They can persist for decades. Fetal cells also appear to target sites of injury, crossing both the placental and blood-brain barriers. And this is also fascinating, because um, you'll meet some patients in my presentation who had the therapy more than once. The mother's body accumulates cells from each baby. And the next pregnancy, those cells will contribute both to the mother and combine as two families to continue helping the mother and even, if necessary, aid in the new pregnancy. These are the two men that were the original co-founders of this on planet Earth, basically. The man standing behind the desk, Dr. Alexander Smigadoop, with a white coat, he had been working on this in the 70s using mice, uh, any sort of mammal you can think of. Into the 80s, he started honing more in on the human side when he met Dr. Alexei Karpenko. Dr. Alexei Karpenko comes from a long line of sort of revolutionary medical uh, pioneers of the region, both in the Russian region and Ukraine. This is their clinic today, MCEL. Now, what, here's what you might ask, okay, I'm going to get into this. So how does it happen? 
so basically socialized medicine in the country of Ukraine, a lot of free abortion clinics. If a woman is going to have an abortion, they are asked, it has to be seven to 12 weeks. That is sort of like the sweet spot when it comes to non-DNA matching problems, no, no rejection of the body. It's sort of the sweet spot, again, discovered during the pregnancy process when those cells leave and help the mom. So the, the person is asked, you wanna throw these away or would you like to donate them to science? If the donor wants to donate them, the donor is then tested for all bacterial infections, all viral infections, HIV, everything you can think of. If she passes the test, they will take the fetal material. It is immediately sent to MSL's biotechnology laboratory, where it is then, there I am, I, I'm actually one of the few people in the public that is not a scientist that, that they, I, like, it took me six months to convince them to let me get in that lab. And, I, and it took me longer than that to let me even do the movie with them. <laughs> so uh, as you can imagine, you know, especially some American member of the media, and I'll get into later, they're not, they don't need any more publicity. They're doing just fine. They'd rather continue on with their science and not have any you know, earthquakes around them. So anyway, there I am going into the lab. This is basically like sort of the short list of what they um, extract from the fetus. They basically take all pieces of all the organ systems of the fetus. And again, everybody wants to know, are they clean? How do we know they're safe? They have a research and development side that takes care of whether or not they're viable. So they, while they don't believe in replicating the cells, they don't believe in making copies of them to avoid the abortion, they feel that having them straight from the abortion process and not manipulating them beyond that is the best way. But they will make, see if they grow to see if they're viable, to see if they will grow new families. That's the research and development, microbiology is all bacteria you can think of, polymerase chain reactions to make sure there's no viral contamination. And I'll say, you might ask, why am I focusing on this company or this clinic or these group of scientists? Because they're simply the only place on earth this is being done to this caliber. I'm not trying to promote them. They just happen to be the only place out there. It's not legal in any other country on earth. And I'll get into more of that in a, later in the talk. They have some of the latest, most uh, groundbreaking technology. Some of, the, some of the best equipment you find in the US in re regarding sorting the stem cells, testing them, they have it in their facility. Now, before I get in, I'm going to get into some of the patients, what this stuff can do, what these cells can do. I thought nothing would be more appropriate than to show you the very first patient they ever treated. So when they finally kind of figured out the regulatory framework to allow this to be like approved, they worked with the Ukraine Ministry of Health. In fact, the Ukraine Ministry of Health was very much a part of making sure they came to be. This was not a clinic back in the 80s, in the early 90s. They were in a state hospital in one room. And they found a kid, about the age of that kid uh, in the middle, that kid today is the man on the right. They found a kid who, whose parents had purchased milk from a radiated milk farm due to Chernobyl. It was right around that time period. He was suffering from bone marrow failure or a plastic anemia. He was living off of blood transfusions and he was waiting for a bone marrow transplant. As you can imagine, the parents were very desperate. Those two men I showed you earlier approached his parents and said, we want to inject your child with something that we're working on. And they explained it was liver cells, that, and the parents really didn't understand it. They said, sure. They gave this man, once a child, about seven years old, who was waiting for a bone marrow transplant to just live, living off of blood transfusions. He was given the death sentence. Two rounds of only fetal liver cells, not the whole thing, just the liver cells, cured him of a plastic anemia. He's still alive today. He's never had any therapy whatsoever since that, those days. Um, and the reason why the liver? What's so fascinating about this therapy is at the time of gestation, end of first trimester, the bone marrow and the whole body's immune and like blood system is just being formed. And all of that good ingredients to make that is in the liver. So the liver fetal stem cells are one of the most powerful parts of this whole soup that this therapy consists of. I was on, in the movie, I was on Skype with him and his parents. He's in Switzerland, his parents in the Ukraine. There I am with Alexi, the co-founder of the clinic and co-inventor, which is also fascinating. It wasn't until my movie and I was on Skype that did the parents even know what they injected their child. They didn't fully understand it until I made the movie and included them in it. And there he is again on Skype. All right, so that's me. And one thing to do the movies I've done that cover these topics, and it's another to be a participant. And I've had fetal stem cell therapy three times. I'm gonna get it my fourth time this year. 
So you might ask me why, what's wrong with you, Eric? Nothing. Fetal stem cell therapy on the, just the health side is one of the most rejuvenating, exciting, preventative, almost cheating mother nature things you can do. Um, so, I, and I honestly, I didn't set out to be a patient, but I kept meeting all these other people that were like busy professionals like me that would get it. And um, they were telling me how their lives improved, they were more productive, you name it. I honestly started getting jealous and I just had this sort of light bulb moment. My God, I'm putting myself in this movie. I'm gonna get this myself. So, there, okay, let me get, kind of give you the overview of what happens to you at this clinic if you get fetal stem cell therapy. Different ailments, it's, it's personalized medicine. Not everyone's treated the same. It's not much like most therapies where, you know, okay, you have this ailment, turn the page, blah, 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 you get this. Every patient that goes there, they, they wanna see your uh, medical data before you go, and then they'll do their own, batter, own battery of testing on you before they start. So, I'm, so even though this is me, if you have Parkinson's, you have a child with autism, or whatever reason that you, someone wants to go there, it's, I'm giving you this because it's kind of similar in, in the way it's all laid out. On day one, they give me an ultrasound of my abdomen and thyroid, wanted to make sure things were going okay with that. A huge blood and urine panel, uh, ECG, all of that. And from that, they compare that data they've done in their own lab with the data that I've submitted to them. And then, on, then the, after that's done, they kind of have a meeting with me and they tell me what they're gonna do over the next three days. And I, I'm there for, most patients are there for two to three days. It's like a work day, six to eight hours a day some days. So they kind of lay it out for me. Um, the cells, there's basically two places of injection. The liver cells and the more immune cells are given in the bloodstream. The more neuronal related or hormonal cells are given in the fat around the abdomen. That keeps the best body temperature. All the years of doing this, they found that they release in a more controlled manner in the fat around the abdomen, the subcutaneous injections. My goals for day one when they explain to me, and this goes for every patient, even if you're going there for Parkinson's or MS or, or whatever, a stroke or you had a heart attack, it's, the, the cells kind of will treat each patient the same. So again, why I'm talking about myself so much here. What's the most fascinating thing about this is they will grow new blood vessels, new capillaries. So someone is older, you can imagine how beneficial that is. And I'll get into my father later with his type 2 diabetes. And if it wasn't for this, I don't think he would have had such an improvement. So they kind of explain this to you. You're going to have better um, you know, circulation. You're going to have better liver function for many of the things I talked about. Of course, you're going to have a better immune system and bone marrow um, you know, on the first day. So they, they categorize the cells on the first day with these goals in mind. On day two, they kind of focus on both your digestion as well as your sort of memory and neurological side of you. And on day three, they work on more of the muscle and the cartilage and the tendons. And interesting enough, at the bottom, the sexual functions, everybody gets older, you know, our libido drops, we're not 18 years old, um, you know. But one of the first things that I noticed after they, they sort of kicked in was like the libido just exploded. I was just like, what is happening? Um, again, that's not why I go get the therapy, but it just it lets you know, it lets you know that something is happening to you, you know. So again, this is sort of like a short list of things that I've noticed. My ability to focus and calculate, what's also fascinating about this therapy, again, if you're going for a devastating ailment, these things will happen to you anyway. You know how you get frustrated and you're having a bad day and maybe you get an email that's really just really irritates you and you don't think about it and you shoot back a crappy response and you, the next day you go, oh my God, I really should have thought on that. I started doing that for the first time and the cells kicked in. I started handling the highest stress moments with clarity, like I had been a Zen master for like the last 10 years. Like I, I've been studying transcendental meditation. Like it was the most bizarre thing to go through what they do to you psychologically. And like sort of this leveling out and this confidence that you feel, it's fascinating. Um, obviously like blood work just normalizes. it. Like all of us, we have, always have something kind of out of whack. Everything went right in line. Didn't change my lifestyle, carried on the way I did. Um, yeah, anyway, okay, this is really fascinating. This is really fascinating. This, I just got permission to talk about this two days ago. Now, one of the skeptical arguments, as we talked about earlier, is, oh, how do you know the body doesn't just kick the cells out? How do you know? Forget about the fact that we've known for decades that the cells will migrate to the mother, and they'll say, oh, that's the mother's child. Of course, no, because that's a technically, genetically different child. 
If that child is born and grows up, that does not mean that child can give that mother a kidney. It does not mean that there's a definite match. That is a genetically different human being inside the, the woman and the mother. So they said, how do we devise a test to prove that these cells remain in your system? And I'm a part of a study group. I'm a part of like a dozen people. They just started doing this uh, study group. And this is my telomere length before and after therapy. I mean, most people know what telomeres are. They're sort of like the plastic sheath on a shoelace. And you're born, they're really strong. And as your shoelaces wear, they kind of fall apart and your shoelace frays. And your telomeres are like the ends of your chromosomes. And how strong they are kind of dictates how well your cells can divide and your overall vitality. A big misconception about telomeres is you see a lot of commercial telomere testing today where you get your telomeres measured and they say your biological age is this because you're born on this day, but your real age is this because of your telomeres. It's not necessarily true because there are infants with shorter telomeres than 50 year olds. How does that work if that's true? So again, adding more to the convoluted nature of the space, I just want to make it understood that fetal stem cell therapy did not make my telomeres grow. What this study proves is the cells stayed in me. And the reason being is that at the top of the chart, that is August of 2017, I had already had my first round of cells in 2016 of the summer. A year passed. I was getting my second round of cells. I started participating in the study. My, and by the way, they use a flow, fish flow technology. It measures the telomere down to the white blood cell level. You can't go to LifeLink or all these commercial places and get this kind of test. It's not, it's not, it's not reliable. Um, in fact, I don't want to get down that road, but the commercial telomere testing is a whole other can of worms. This is the most accurate test you can do to measure telomeres, is the Flowfish method. 5.38 kb. So there, that was me after one round of cells before my second round. Got round two. A year later, before my third round, look how they jumped up. And what this means is not that my telomeres grew. What it means is those young, full-length, brand-new telomeres that were injected into me in the fetal stem cells mingled duplicated, created families, and um, kind of like became a part of me to the point where they affected my telomere measurements. That's unbelievable. <laughs> Again, the study is ongoing. I'm not saying this is finite. I'm in the middle of this. They're in the middle of it. I, again, I had to convince them to let me talk about this and handled it properly, which is why I'm beating this dead horse. They don't make them grow. There's no proof that your telomeres are going to grow. But what this proves is, is that the full-length brand-new telomeres mingling with my 46-year-old are multiplying to such a degree that they have such a jump. And by the way, on average, the longest telomere length in people is 8.7. I'm jumping up to 7.23. It's really remarkable. I was right in the middle, in the middle of average. I'm way above average a year later. So I'm happy to answer questions about this later. But the point is, while it's not finished, they're going to have this peer-reviewed and published. They are starting to be able to prove that these cells stay in you. Forget about the fact that people are doing great and people are walking around and they shouldn't be. And that's not enough because it's anecdotal evidence. How do we know it was the cells for all the skeptical arguments about many of the things talked about in this conference? This proves it. They're in your system for at least a year. We'll see how that goes. If I'm here next year, I'll give you an update on where I'm at.